To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds, and your toil, and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil man. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. This church in Ephesus is an exemplary church mentioned here in Revelations. It was a real church that was under the Apostle Paul's mentorship and was the recipient of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Jesus is walking amongst the seven churches in Asia. He is walking amongst this church first, and he sees that they labor and toil to spread the gospel and minister to people in need. They persevere despite opposition, and they cannot tolerate sin or anything evil. And if anyone having an evil attachment or evil desire steps into their church, they can spiritually detect it and confront the man or woman about this matter and deal with it. They can discern false Christians amongst their group and stop any false teacher from preaching a false gospel. All these things they do and do well. They have many commendable works, but Jesus is overseeing the church and something still isn't right. In fact, he is even grieved. He says to this church, I have this against you. Despite all that this church is doing, Jesus still has something against them. I don't know about you, but of all the things that Jesus could tell me right now, I would be very afraid and convicted if Jesus were to tell me straight up that he is against me about something. He's telling them, I am against you, because you have left your first love. Jesus isn't talking about your family or a girl you liked uh, first in your past. He's talking about himself. As much as this church was laboring and toiling to minister the gospel, they were so busy doing all of that, all of what they did, they no longer had time to spend in communion with the head of their own church, Jesus himself. If we read further, we see that Jesus is grieved so much about this matter that he even considers time spent apart from him as a fall. Jesus continues his warning in Revelation 2.5, Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. God desires an on-fire relationship with us, and if we do not maintain it and keep it alive through continual prayer, Jesus counts that as a falling away from him. Now you say, wait a minute. I can understand going back to an addiction as a fall, but not talking to God as a fall? I have a busy schedule. Surely God would understand that I have a demanding job and kids that require all my time and energy. I've tried to maintain a prayer life, but I don't have time to pray anymore. I understand that. I'm in those shoes too. Yes, things get really busy, especially during the Christmas season. But on the contrary, Jesus understands perfectly. This is why it grieves him that we have a stressful environment every day, and yet we spend all the free time we do have at the gym, social media, with friends, or playing games to recharge our batteries, but don't spend any time with him, especially when he knows that we will feel so much better with him than when we do all these other things. Jesus' expectations of us as his bride are so high that if we are not spending quality time with him, it is as if we have already fallen away. Jesus is saying, Remember the day you got saved, 
or when you were baptized, how on fire you were for me? I wasn't just first in your life, I was everything to you. Remember that? How you spent time with me? Go back to that. Repent and rekindle that fire you once had for me in your heart. Or else, I will have no choice but to remove your lampstand. I will cut myself off from you because I cannot stand your silence to me anymore. In Matthew 7.21, we see him say it again like this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus himself is saying that we can have a very great and powerful ministry, the power to cast out demons and do many wonders. But he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It is God's will that we also spend time with his son Jesus. If we are not maintaining a relationship with Jesus, he'll say he never knew us, and that we are equal to those who do not have the law of God in our hearts. Now, we can still go to the gym, we can play games, and we can have fellowship with friends in person or on social media. I'm not saying that any of that is sinful. But if those things take our attention and time away from God, Jesus says that he is jealous of our time. And if it carries on and on and on, he'll remove our lampstand and cut us off if there is no repentance of it. That is how seriously Jesus takes relationships. He's not being an overly strict parent. He's trying to woo us back to himself by showing us how much we really need him if we want to continue in his walk and enter into his rest. He is quick to forgive us if we come to him in genuine repentance. But he is concerned when even time is devoted to something else. I am showing you all this because with this in mind, we are going to be approaching a study in the book of Judges, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. And in order to understand the judgments of Jesus throughout these books in the Old Testament, we have to first understand God's perspective. Otherwise, God will appear to just be an angry judge and a mass murderer. The biggest question people have concerning the Old Testament is why God ordered the annihilation of the Canaanites with no hope of forgiveness. Well, the Canaanites actually used to be worshipers of God. Canaan was Noah's grandson from Ham, Noah's son. We read further that during the time of Abraham's travels, the Canaanites at least had a knowledge of God and a fear of God after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see that in Genesis 20. Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shar and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, Will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he, Abraham, not say to me, She is my sister? And she, even she herself said, He is my brother? In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. So Abimelech already knew what it meant to take someone else's wife according to God's law. 
That makes sense because his ancestors are from Noah. And he knew who exactly it was who was speaking to him and was immediately afraid because he called his name Jehovah in the original text. He said, Jehovah, will you slay a righteous nation also? He's saying this because he knew how Sodom was destroyed. And now the same God who destroyed Sodom was coming to him in a dream, accusing him of iniquity when he thought he wasn't doing anything wrong. But God continues. God said to him in a dream, Yes, I knew that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know this, that you will surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told them all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid. So the kings of the Canaanites may have still known God at this time. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah could have awakened them to submit to God. But we've seen already that even a neglected relationship with God can remove a lampstand of a church if no one heeds any warnings about it. A falling away starts with a neglected prayer life, and then other things come in to replace the time spent with God. They could range from innocent to ungodly addictions, to passive or active idol worship. You know what God has commanded, but you don't know God. These idols are all you know. Who made the earth you're sitting on? Who made the rocks, the sky, this thing? This thing of clay? No, God did. There is uncovered evidence that they even sacrificed their newborn to two-year-old children to Moloch, one of their gods. And this act of wickedness amongst many was what drove the Lord to anger against them. But God gave them time to repent. 430 years before Israel was set free from Egypt, God waited. And then, 41 years after that, when God delayed Israel to enter the Promised Land because of disobedience. We see in Joshua that the Canaanites were greatly afraid and greatly disheartened when Israel neared their border. But they never repented to the Lord. So God had to destroy them as an example for Israel that this is what happens when nations rebel against God and do things to drive them to anger. So is God a mass murderer? No. I've already made this point clear in the God is Life video. But man and beast kill one another as created beings. As the creator of all life, God is outside of matter, space, and time. So he doesn't kill or murder anyone. God simply moves the soul of a man from one life to another. He can take life anytime he wants. In fact, if Christianity's true, people don't really die, they just change locations, right? They go from this life to the next life, and God can do that whenever He wants. In fact, God has the right to usher people into the next life, whether they are two years old or 82 years old, because people never die, they just change locations. So while it's not fair for us to take innocent life, God can do it anytime He wants. There is temporary life here on earth then eternal life afterwards, whether that be in heaven or hell. He is a just judge. God hates the killing and torturing of people and takes absolutely no pleasure in commanding it or allowing it to be so. But he had to destroy certain people so that no one else who saw the destruction would want to repeat their acts of evil. And God had to punish Israel who copied their actions so that his people would see their error and repent of it. He does it to bring his people back to himself. He is not an angry judge.
These books we are going to be looking at tell a sad tale of God's chosen people rebelling against Him. Yet it also shows how quick to forgive God is no matter how often we sin or what our sin is. However, it also shows that even though God does forgive us when we ask, it is not an everything-goes relationship. Our disobedience to God does not go without consequences, and if we choose to fall away completely from God, though He will make attempts to lead us back to Himself, there will be a point to which He will cut us off completely if we continue to refuse Him. If you made it this far in the video, you've seen already that even innocently devoting our time to something else rather than our relationship to Christ, no matter how good a thing it may be, even if it was simply the creation of this video. God says, I am against you. Can you now see why Israel was judged very severely? They not only ceased to fellowship with God, they turned to Baal worship. Can you now see with clearer understanding why God was so angry with their sin? There is no such thing as once saved, always saved. That is a point that Jesus makes concerning the foolish virgins who let their oil burn out in their lamps. In Matthew 25, 1, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Then at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go down and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going to go out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready to meet with him went into the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Jesus continued, Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Watch and be ready. The door is always open for anyone to enter God's rest. But when judgment has come, the door is shut. And for those outside, whether they think they are a Christian or not, it is too late to enter through repentance. It's too late. But before the bridegroom comes, there is yet time to heed to any convictions in your heart and repent, allowing Jesus to fill you up with his love so that the oil in your lamps will always continue to burn until he comes again.